Uh, I'm very excited to, to be here when you know, there is all this ex excitement in the city. I really like also the, the campus. I'm really enjoying the, this futuristic building and I'm really impressed by the, the meetings I had so far. So uh, today we'll tell you a little bit about our work uh, in, um, in Cologne. And uh, I will have talk in two parts, so um, bear with me. At the end, the microbes will come. Uh, so the focus of the lab is really to understand the genetic basis of vertebrate aging in the context of evolution. I like to think of myself and my group as a group of um, evolutionary biologists. Uh, and so we'd like to frame all our questions uh, within this, uh, the, this framework. So um, very much interested in diversity in nature and um, this slide uh, represents how different organisms uh, solve similar problems and um, when it comes to the aging uh, and longevity uh, these different species are champions in their own uh, respect so you may recognize some familiar organisms here uh, to you and so this is a Greenland shark that you may know lives several hundreds years apparently uh, and flatworms that uh, seem to be have a very similar longevity to, um, uh, to hydras, at least in, uh, in captivity. And these are other very long-lived um, organisms. On the other side of the spectrum, we have very short-lived um, organisms that live as adults uh, for a few hours only, like the mayfly. And other, other species like you know, the, the Pacific salmons uh, or the bamboo forests that have a very peculiar life history. They survive as adults a reasonable amount of time and then just after reproduction, they are semelparous, they reproduce and then they die right away. So um, uh, other organisms like, for example, you social insects uh, have a very interesting life history. Queens and workers have a completely different um, uh, life expectancy. Queens live several decades, also in ants, and workers live just a few, uh, a few weeks, a few months. Uh, so same genomes, but completely different strategies, and this can be modulated by what they are fed, uh, etc. So try to understand, you know, the question is how do dif different species control this uh, uh, homeostasis and uh, uh, how, you know, whether the aging program is a program uh, or it's something else, and what is the underlying molecular mechanism. So to ask, you know, to answer these questions, of course, the one approach is a comparative approach, uh, and you can sequence genomes and trying to find the gene that is responsible for this or that phenotype. Another approach is to uh, have a more experimental, uh, you know, uh, minded, uh, uh, you know, uh, intervention. And so in the aging field, uh, uh, really like when it comes to vertebrates, experimentally mice have been uh, the reference model. Uh, a little bit of work has been done in zebrafish experimentally and more, you know, recently naked mole rats have been used. Uh, but, you know, the problem with studying aging in mice is that uh, they live quite some time. You know, even if they are relatively short-lived, doing a, a lifespan assay in mice can be quite challenging. Uh, these organisms live uh, several years, and so uh, I can oftentimes say, you know, uh, if you want to do an, a life-extending intervention in mice, that will take you know longer than your PhD to graduate or your postdoc to to do that. So it's a very expensive uh, um, uh, commitment. Uh, that's why you know non-vertebrate systems have been so successful and. Um, you know, they are fantastic genetic models and we have learned uh, a lot from them. So we learn about shared pathways, molecular pathways that regulate the aging process and they're important for longevity, FOXO pathway, uh, insulin IGF pathway and, uh, you know, mTOR pathway have been found in these organisms and they have been, you know, shown to be relevant also <coughs> all the way to, to mammalian um, lifespan and aging. So, so they are very important when it comes to finding basic uh, and shared uh, molecular mechanisms regulating especially cellular uh, aging. So, but when it comes to vertebrate specific, uh, you know, physiology and aging, they may not be the best uh, uh, place to look at. And so, uh, you, you know, you're lacking uh, uh, insight into, for example, what is the involvement of adaptive immune system in the aging process, or for example, how cancer uh, occurs during aging and why that is important for, for the aging process and, and other other phenotypes. Therefore, it's very important to go back to vertebrates. And this is what, you know, in part motivated my interest in developing a new vertebrate, uh, uh, you know, short-lived system, which is the turquoise killifish in this case, that just lives a few months uh, in nature and in captivity. It's about just uh, four months as median lifespan. 
So uh, this is the, the, the turquoise killifish. These are like, you know, adult killifish. These are males on the top and females on the bottom. So you see there are uh, interesting changes happening with age. This is a fully reproductive adult, so females and males again. And then you see changes happening as they get older. So these are, you know, four months old uh, individuals that look, you know, particularly decrepit in this, in this, in this state. Uh, this is the same individual at five weeks of age and then, you know, seven weeks later, they really undergo dramatic changes in their appearance. They lose in melanocytes, the, the tail, you can no more recognize this nice, you know, banding pattern, like, you know, this black and yellow stripes, they are no more uh, detectable in the, in the old individuals that become so pale and, uh, and other things change. I will show you them a few age-related phenotypes in the killifish. And it reminds a little bit of what happened to David Lynch as he got older. So, you know, you have this depigmentation. So the, the whole point is that maybe looking at, you know, mechanisms underlying depigmentation and other phenotypes that change with age in the killifish can teach us something about the aging process in our species. Um, together with uh, uh, Anja Schneider uh, at the DZ&E, uh, uh, we've looked at uh, biomarkers uh, in the brain of the killifish and we see accumulation of phosphotau, for example, which is uh, um, a very important marker for some neurodegenerative diseases. So, uh, Habitat 42, uh, intraneuronal, uh, accumulates with aging in killifish spontaneously, so this is a sporadic event. This is not induced by genetic mutations or by environmental interventions. So this is again phosphotau, neurofilament and DAPI, which accumulates uh, phosphotau with age. Uh, and uh, this is the gut of the fish. So this is a section of the gut of a young fish, and this is an old fish. And this purple staining uh, represents uh, accumulation of uh, fibro fibrosis. So this is collagen. So you see that there are outstanding changes happening between young and old uh, gut. You know, also you have a thickening of this space here, and then you have more purple here, more fibrosis uh, with time, um, spontaneously increasing with age, which is a hallmark of aging, not only for this species. This is another slide showing the same thing. Um, so these are two different stainings on the top, myson trichome, and on the bottom, picrocilius red. You see again that young, which is seven weeks old fish, have less fibrosis compared to old fish, which is this. So this is a, you know, a change occurring spontaneously in the gut. So this is the heart. So the heart accumulates this autofluorescence lipofuscin uh, in young, from a young, middle age and age. This is the quantification. This was done by Gaurav, a postdoc in the lab. And this is senescent associated beta galactosidis, which is a marker of senescence in the heart, increasing with age again, uh, from young, middle age and, uh, uh, and old. So, and aged. So, uh, we also found, you know, this type of senescent associated beta galactosidis increase in skin, uh, liver, uh, and um, in skin and liver as well. So this is a, a skeletal prep done together with Bjorn Busse at the uh, university in, in Hamburg, so not too far from here. So this is a young killifish and this is an old killifish. You see like a very strong spine curvature happening with age spontaneously. And you also have loss of uh, mineral density. So it's not quantified here, but uh, believe me, I mean, we have a dramatic loss of, uh, uh, of bone density with, uh, with age. And so we're trying to understand what's going on, what's underlying this, uh, these changes with age. So there are several other phenotypes that happen, you know, the change with age, um, for example, uh, also behavior changes with age, the fish become less active, they can learn, you know, their learning performance is decreased, uh, undergo cellular senescence, I showed you that, they undergo neurodegeneration, sarcopenia, loss of fecundity in both sexes, neoplasia, so cancer is very prevalent in killifish and reduce regenerative capacity. So this work has been uh, done part by us and part by other groups and it's published. So if you are interested in any of these, uh, I, can, I, can, uh, I can point you to the papers. So uh, during my postdoc and then actually also after my postdoc, um, I continue developing you know, tools for the killifish in particular transgenesis. So now we can engineer the genome, so we can edit the genome, we can uh, insert randomly into the genome uh, expression cassettes, for example, using the TOL2 uh, transpose system, which has been applied from the zebrafish field. Uh, and CRISPR-Cas9 uh, was also recently developed together with Itamar Harel, who's now a professor at the University of Jerusalem, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. And so um, we can do both, uh, you know, um, homologous recombination as well as uh, deletions, um, you know, uh, at specific target sites of the genome. 
But I will not talk about this. So in part of what we do in the lab is really developing tools for this, um, you know, uh, this model to, to kind of like uh, be used uh, by the community, by a growing community. Uh, and this involves transgenesis, genetic maps and genomes, etc., husbandry protocols and different strains. But you know, we try to use this, these tools to address outstanding questions. And one question is that how these species uh, evolve to become so short-lived. So maybe for the next few minutes, I will tell you a little bit about this, and then we go to the, to the final part, which has to do with the microbiome. So I'll tell you a little bit about where this fish is coming from. So this is the area of the world where the fish come from. It's Southeast Africa. So it comes, it lives between Zimbabwe and, uh, and, and uh, Mozambique. And these are localities where we've been collecting fish over time. It has a very peculiar life cycle. So um, it lives, it's a freshwater fish. It only lives in um, areas where there are seasonal rainfalls. So during the wet season, it starts raining. So the fish hatches, they reproduce, they lay eggs, and the eggs will either stay in the dry mud for months, even years. Uh, and this is a very peculiar adaptation of this species. So they can survive complete drought by staying in the mud uh, and in an arrested developmental state. So that's called diapause. Uh, and this is actually very convenient because you can exchange and share embryos and strains among labs. So you can simply drop them in an envelope and then ship them uh, by mail. And then the person who receives them will add water and they will hatch. Uh, so, uh, in a way, it's an instant fish. And, but then in the lab, you know, um, you can actually uh, replicate, you know, lines in a short time uh, by uh, incubating them in water and then under certain conditions, you can actually hatch them in 12 days. So you can, you know, you can, you can have several fish lines in a short time. Uh, this is very convenient because we, since we can, like I so, as I showed you, we can generate transgenic fish you can generate transgenic lines in a very short time, much, much faster than in zebrafish. This is again where the, you know, this is Africa. So this is a climate map of Africa. The fish comes from a very dry part of Africa. This one, this is a uh, red, is very dry. You see it's the Sahara Desert, the Kalahari Desert and the Namib. And also this part between Zimbabwe and Mozambique, that's where they come from. Uh, and so that's where we actually do field work. So part of the work that we do is actually um, collecting fish and studying population genetics. I will just tell you a, a very little part about population genetics in this fish and genomics. So we fly on with this little plane over the Ghana Région National Park. We find localities like these where there is water and then we drive to those localities. And this is actually David, uh, a PhD student in my lab and Alex, lab, the lab manager. We collected this fish, for example, from these localities. So this is a typical turquoise killifish and this is another species actually, the spotted killifish. So why we're interested in this different population is because, you know, depending on where you collect them in, uh, in their natural habitat, they will be short lived or long lived. And these differences in lifespan will persist over generation. So this is the same species. They differ in uh, survival and in other phenotypes that I won't tell you now about. And so since this is the same species, we could cross them. Uh, we could cross the same, the, the different populations. And so that's what I did during my postdoc. I crossed long-lived with short-lived. And this is the survival of the, of the P0 and the F1 and F2. So uh, Long, li long lifespan is uh, dominant and uh, non-maternally inherited. So we can use age of death as a phenotype and map it using uh, quantitative trait loci mapping. And this is a slide that represents a lot of years of work. So this is a map of the genome of the killifish, which on the external ring, you have the linkage groups. Uh, the internal, the second ring is actually the linkage map. So these are markers of the genome uh, associated based on co-segregation frequencies. This one is actually the scaffolds of the genome that we sequenced and we assembled using the linkage map. So we use the linkage map as a scaffolding system. And then the internal part is actually association between longevity and uh, position. So that means that there are parts of the genome where, you know, for example, this one, where there is a very strong association between how long the, your fish are, how long lived your fish are and, uh, and, and, and the genotype in that particular region. For example, in this chromosome that I showed you, which is chromosome three, so if you walk along the chromosome, there will be a genotype specific uh, predictability of how long lived you are if you're an F2 fish. So that means that if you are blue, it means that you have both alleles for coming from the short lived grandmother. And that predicts how, how long lived you are. On the y axis is longevity, median lifespan. So if you have both alleles coming from your short lived grandmother, you will be short lived. 
If you have one allele from the long-lived grandfather, you will, be, uh, you will have intermediate lifespan. And if you have both alleles from the long-lived grandfather, you will actually be long-lived. So in other words, genotype predicts your phenotype there. So we did some work on that, uh, and we narrowed down on the region, but I, um, I will not talk about that. Uh, we have the genome, which is available, and you can download it, and you can um, study your favorite gene. Uh, and now we have actually an improved version of the genome. It's also assembled and annotated, and so it's out there for the community. I would like to spend the next uh, three minutes maybe talking about uh, other killifish in Africa. So not only the turquoise killifish is so short-lived, but there are other instances where short lifespan emerged in this, Afri in this clade. So these red you know, branches of this tree represent uh, annualism as a phenotype that evolved. That means short lifespan and embryonic diapause. So that didn't, ha didn't happen once, but it happens many times in the phylogeny of this fish. And the question is that what genomic events underlie the evolution of this very peculiar trait? How do you become short-lived? And how do you become short-lived? And so that's a question that Ray, a postdoc in the lab, asked. And so to ask, answer this question, he sequenced the genome of all these species. So these are 46 different species, and he was able to uh, he sequence them at different coverage tiers. And so, um, and he studied in particular the emergence of this annualism that happened once, twice, three times, and even four times in a more basal clade. So comparing these genomes, and in particular clades that are actually evolved annualism, he could identify features of the genome associated with annualism. And in particular, he uses five species uh, that he sequenced at a very high coverage, uh, more than 200x coverage, to map all those other species confidently. Otherwise, if we just have one good reference genomes, we will be missing a lot of information mapping those other guys on those. So we need to to actually sequence broadly to, to have proper resequencing and mapping of those genomes so we can do some good statistics. So what Ray found in a nutshell is that if you're annual, so if you are short-lived and develop annual um, diapause, your genome is much larger. So you see it goes from 0 0.87 gigabases to 1.55 gigabases. So we see that every time annualism has emerged, the genome has expanded dramatically. And the genome, you know, the, part, the portions of the genome that have expanded, which are shown here, so this is the, the, the repetitive part of the genome. This is a non-repetitive, so this is the repeat length. So if you take the non-repetitive part of the genome, that stays the same across annual and non-annuals. It's the, the repetitive part of the genome that really expands when you become an annual. So there is an expansion of this repetitive element, in particular <coughs> DNA repetitive elements, so there is a correlation between genome size and annualism in, um, in African killifishes. And we're trying to understand uh, how this is happening. And we, we studied genome, you know, gene family expansion and contraction in annuals and non-annuals. And so we can actually now narrow down to specific type of uh, genes. So not only we can look at uh, non-coding parts of the genome, repetitive parts of the genome, but even if we focus on the coding parts of the genome, we can actually see what gene families have expanded, contracted. And we said that immune genes are actually particularly uh, contracted. They lose a lot of genes in the annual species. Uh, this has to do with relaxation of selection, but probably I will go forward. And I will tell you what's the, what's the take home message of this study that we've done, which is that uh, short lifespan emerges in populations that undergo continuous bottlenecks. So we don't think that actually short lifespan is adaptive by any means. We think that uh, populations that live in very harsh environments are actually um, under very uh, weak selection. So there is a strong selection for strong sexual very quick sexual maturation and for diapause, but ma maintenance mechanisms are actually under weaker selection, and those will accumulate a lot of mutations, even deleterious mutations. And this is what's shown here is actually what happens in annual species. These are uh, genes that accumulate a lot of deleterious mutations. For example, top tree, top topoisomerase tree, mTOR, FOXO tree. These are DNA repair genes, and this is polymerase gamma. So we see a genome-wide accumulation of mutations, both at the level of the coding and non-coding portion of the genome. So we have this increased genomic noise in uh, annual species that also have a smaller effective population size. So we think that demography is really the driver in genome evolution in this uh, short-lived populations and species. Okay, so then um, 
this is also compatible and uh, in line with what we saw before uh, in the QTL mapping study. So in the QTL mapping study so, uh, that we did before, what we saw is that the genetic architecture of longevity in this species is not simple. So it's not due to single genes, accumulation of one single deleterious mutations, but it's actually genome-wide, very complex phenotype driven by many, many different genes, even within one species. This is not very important. Actually, this is important, but... Uh, so, in, in other words, uh, what we see is that ecology in this species uh, and in different species of African turquoise killifish, and each single uh, disc um, ring here represents a different species that we've sequenced. And these are dis different bioclimate uh, uh, informations regarding, for example, temperature of coldest month correlates with genome size in African killifishes and the temperature of the driest quarter correlates with genome size in African killifishes. In other words, we can now connect ecological parameters, therefore selective pressures or lack thereof, to genomic features like genome size, for example, in this case. And this is mean temperature of the coldest quarter. Okay, now we'll switch gear. And uh, um, what I'm gonna tell you about now is um, this part here which has to do with the use of the killifish as an experimental system to ask uh, interesting questions for us. So part of what I told you is that we are very much interested in developing tools, understanding the basic biology of this organism, but what I'm gonna tell you now is how can we use, how can we harness this, you know, this toolbox in a way to address interesting questions, for example, in the aging field. And the question that I want to ask is the following. So uh, in the aging field, um, there is this very naive you know, vision of the organism or something that is disconnected from, uh, from its environment, from the context, the ecological context in, in which it uh, lives and it evolved. However, we know, and you guys are really spearheading this, this vision, that it's much more complicated than that. What is it known though, is that different stimuli, different environmental features are really importantly modulating the aging process and developmental processes. We know the temperature, food, drugs, and all these other you know, uh, inputs dramatically affect and modulate the, the aging process. So, uh, of course, one, one, one way to think about this is that there is an intermediate layer between all those environmental stimuli, stimuli and the host uh, homeostasis, if you want, which has been neglected in the aging field specifically. So this, this intermediate layer is able to translate information from the environment to change information that comes from the host itself to generate new, uh, uh, new signals that feed into the, the host itself. And of course, I'm talking about the microbiota. <coughs> so our thinking was, what is the function, what is the role of the microbiota in this very intricate homeostatic process that fails when we age? Is there any causal role into this, uh, uh, into this complex, intricate uh, communication? And so specifically, we're gonna reason about the gut microbiota. This is a cross-section of the killifish gut. This is the lumen. So, uh, of course, we know that on the one hand, the gut microbiota integrates information from uh, the outside world. On the other hand, it also modulates uh, very uh, finely, um, like, you know, many different processes, including immunity, metabolism, drug responses, pathogenicity, and nutrient absorption. The question specifically is, does the gut microbiota affect aging? So we do this in the killifish. So killifish, just uh, FYI, have a very simple, uh, have a very similar uh, intestine uh, to ours. So they have this uh, mucus secreting cells. So this is an electron micro, uh, micrograph done by uh, Jens in my lab. Um, so that's the killifish, this is a mouse. These are actually the junctions between uh, epithelial cells. You see the microvilli here, this is mouse, this is turquoise killifish. And this is the gut, uh, a typical gut for a killifish. So they have, it's a tree, uh, is divided in three portions. This is a distal part, this is proximal and bulb. And they have these lamellar-like structures um, rather than pure villi like we do. But well, the lumen is, uh, is in the middle here, of course. So what, what uh, Pat, a, a postdoc in the lab did, who initiated this, who spearheaded this project, was to isolate uh, genomic DNA from the, uh, the killifish uh, intestinal microbes. And then he did 16S uh, sequencing. Probably I don't need introduction in this audience. Uh, and so he amplified specifically the V3, V4 region. After sequencing these amplicons, he then mapped them to reference databases. So in this way, he can have in one shot an understanding of the 
diversity and relative abundance of these different taxa. So what we found, this is a logarithmic scale, this is richness. Kilitish have a very diverse gut microbiota, uh, similar to that of other vertebrates and even mammals. However, the composition is different from compared to that of um, mammals. Normally, aquatic organisms seem to be dominated by proteobacteria. You see here that flies and worms have a much poorer um, gut microbiota, at least in the lab. So the advantage is that, again, we have a very, you know, a species with a very diverse gut microbiota above, but it's very short-lived below, right? So you have a very short-lived species that enables you to do uh, to ask questions that connect microbiota composition with physiological uh, traits like, for example, longevity and aging. Uh, although the relative composition of different phyla uh, in, the, in the gut intestine, or bacteria in the gut, uh, in, the, in, the gut, in the gut, in fish is different from humans, the four most abundant phyla are actually shared between fish and, uh, and humans. So those are proteobacteria, firmicutes, actinobacteria, and bacteroidetes. So since we have this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, localities and uh, where we collected fish in the wild, we asked the question of how much the gut microbiota of the killifish in the lab resembles the gut microbiota of the killifish in nature. So, um, so these are three localities, one at the border between Mozambique and Zimbabwe and two in Mozambique. And this is the laboratory one. So the laboratory seems to be dominated by some protobacteria that I will show you in a few slides. And the, in general, the, the, you know, the, 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 the composition, the diversity of the, lab, the, the, the wild populations, it seems to be higher. So this is a compressed uh, representation of uh, the gut microbiota in the different uh, populations in the wild and in the laboratory ones, the black. So you see that the black, although it's less diverse compared to the wild, still falls within the diversity of the species when it comes to microbial diversity. So it's not uh, far away from, uh, from this dispersion. So it's not you know, clustering away from, from the cloud of the microbes for the species, which is comforting. And if you do like a distance matrix, for example, you see that this is the lab L. You see that if anything, there are uh, la um, wild populations like this M1 here, which are more distant from the other compared to the laboratory one. Okay, so um, then we ask what are, if there are changes occurring in the gut microbiota during the aging process. And so again, Pat compare young and old killifish this time. So, and then compare and check for differences. So this is a young, six week old. This is an old, 16 week old. And uh, this is richness. So you see you, are, you have several hundred bacterial taxa in the young, six week old fish. And then this diversity goes down with age. So you have fewer bacterial taxa in uh, old individual. And uh, this has nothing to do with bacterial load. So if you take stool and you count how many bacteria are present at any time in young and old, there is no real difference. So this is not explained by, 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 by dif you know, different load. So this is really a diversity. Then we did beta diversity using Bray Curtis and unweighted unifrac, but also other measures. And I'm going to show you. And the young and the old killifish, young is green and old is red. Um, actually, I apologize for the colorblind. Uh, but you know, here is the uh, you know the young associated microbes, and here is the old associated microbes. They cluster separately, although there is some overlap, which is interesting. And if you want, we can talk about that later. But uh, they uh, still they differ significantly. Um, so we can detect a difference between young and old associated microbial compositions. And so then we built a phylogeny of microbes associated with either old or young killifish, and we see that so it, this this basically this tree. This is phylogenetic tree. In red uh, dots are taxa that are associated with old killifish, and in green are taxa associated with young killifish. So you see that there is a separation. In particular, older killifish are associated with more proteobacteria compared to younger killifish that are enriched with firmicutes, bacteroidetes, and actinobacteria. And then if we do functional metagenomics using a left analysis, we can actually have some insights into the function of this uh, microbes associated with young or old communities. And uh, uh, this is a discriminant analysis, and this is the score. So in red is the old associated, and in green is young associated. And what we can see is that um, old uh, killifish microbes are more associated with uh, disease terms compared to young uh, killifish microbes, which have a more apparently anabolic function, associated function.
So this was very descriptive, and I told you about you know, differences between the young and the old killifish associated gut microbes. Now we asked whether we can modulate vertebrate aging by manipulating the gut microbiota. So this was our ultimate question, whether you know, there is not only like a correlation, but also a, a causal link between composition and function. So to, uh, you know, to answer this question, so Pat isolated microbes from young killifish, from middle-aged killifish, and then he treated another cohort of middle-aged killifish with uh, uh, antibiotics overnight for 12 hours. And so that depleted the killifish gut from most, but not all, the uh, resident microbes. And then Pat fed back the killifish acutely for 12 hours with microbes coming either from young or for same age um, killifish. And so that happened for 12 hours. So 12 hours, the first treatment, antibiotic treatment, 12 hours of transfer. And then there was a group, ABX, which is antibiotics only treated, that was not recolonized by any uh, donors, microbi microbial community. After this 12, 24 hours total exp you know, treatment, we placed the fish back in the, in the normal tanks. So they were let to swim freely in their home environment. And we asked what happens to those killifish uh, on the long uh, run. And so uh, what we observe is that, so this is a survival curve. So the black fish, the black curve is the survival of the wild type and tr untouched uh, controls. The uh, red are the killifish that receive the same age gut microbes, so OMT, old microbiome transfer, and the green are the ones that receive young gut microbes, so this is the green, and the blue are the ones that receive only antibiotic treatment and they were not recolonized. So as you see, the green ones are living longer than the others. And so again, this is one acute treatment in mid, mid, middle lifespan, which is having dramatic effects, uh, and this was repeated several times. Uh, so we are quite confident about this result. We're very confident about this result. So not only we look at differences in longevity, but also looked at the uh, um, differences in, in, uh, in uh, behavior. So for example, we uh, simply monitor spontaneous locomotor activity in the fish. We put a, tank, a camera on top of the tank, and then we, uh, we measure how active the fish are. And these are atograms. So these are basically traces that trace the locomotor activity of the fish in a given amount of time, in 20 minutes. And so we can quantify, we can use that for quantifications. And then what we see is that young killifish are very active at six weeks, and when they get older, they become less active. We already knew this, we already published in 2006, so we, this was already known. However, what we did, we also tested the activity levels in fish that received young gut microbiome transfer. One week post-transfer, nothing happens among the different groups, but seven weeks post-transfer, an age that corresponds to median lifespan for this species, meaning that 50% of the fish are gone by that time, the fish that receive young gut microbiota stayed more active uh, compared to all the other groups. Um, so indicating that yes, this transfer also has a dramatic effect on uh, activity levels, which is a, a, a measure of, uh, of aging if you want, systemic aging. So then, okay, we did this transfer, but uh, I haven't proven yet, I haven't shown you like whether the transfer worked in and of itself. We see the, the effects, but I haven't shown you whether the microbes that were transferred were indeed settling in the gut of the fish that received them. Therefore, we actually resequenced the gut microbiota of the fish at 16 weeks of age, so seven weeks post-transfer. And then we did the hierarchical clustering, and we saw that actually uh, the YMT, the fish, the fish that received young gut microbiota transfer, were preferentially clustering together with, uh, uh, with the donor young fish. Uh, so meaning that also at 16 weeks, the fish that receive young microbes were still retaining that population, uh, which comforts us in the effectiveness of the transfer. And this is the, the uh, richness of the <coughs> microbes. Then we built, you know, based on uh, uh, co-abundance uh, 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 between different taxa in the different groups, we built these networks trying to understand what microbes are correlated with what other microbes in a given group. For example, young and old have different microbial networks and the size of this uh, of this uh, uh, nodes uh, correlates with the connectivity of each of those meaning that the bigger the node more bacteria are correlated with uh, in abundance with the with the node ones and so we can now name these guys so this is a young associated mi uh, microbial network this is an old associated microbial network and we ask for example what happened to the long lived fish that received the young microbiota transfer you know do they have similar uh, hub 
bacteria compared to the young or the old, and we saw that they had both young associated and old associated uh, hub bacteria. So now we have all of a sudden a list of uh, bacteria that are present in the long lived cohort and also present in the young cohort. And so we can focus on those for their function uh, and their, um, their metabolic function. Uh, interestingly, you may have noticed that the uh, antibiotic treated fish were longer lived. I told you that before. However, we could not, it was slightly longer lived than the wild type, but it, we could not uh, see any young associated hub bacteria in that cohort. They were longer lived than the, than the wild type, but they were not as long lived as the young treated, uh, young microbe treated um, killifish. So, um, then we, uh, we actually did metabolomics. We actually saw that serometabolomics, in this case I'm showing you, this is done uh, untargeted metabolomics. And so we saw that there is a clear distinction between young and old killifish uh, uh, metabolites in the serum. And there are very interesting metabolites like this one, for example, which are very high in the serum of young fish. They are very high in the serum of the fish that are treated with the young gut microbes. And this happens uh, at 16 weeks of age. So these are all old fish, but these are the guys that receive young gut microbiota. So this type of metabolites are interesting to us. Of course, this is corrected for multiple hypothesis testing. And these are the other two old groups, the ones that receive the same age gut microbiota and the wild type old. So then we can isolate many such metabolites that are young, both in, uh, that are high both in the young and in the young treated um, fish, and so we can prioritize and see what they do and what they are. In particular, this is a very interesting metabolite to us because it's a microbial metabolite, which is present in the serum and goes up with age. Not only goes, sorry, goes down with age. And not only goes down with age, but also its abundance in the serum is highly correlated with the abundance of those hub bacteria that are present in the, in the young killifish and in the killifish that live longer after the transfer. So now we can correlate abundance of bacteria, this pr you know, uh, probiotics if you want, uh, putatively pro probiotics, and the abundance of this metabolite in the serum. <laughs> so we're very much interested in the function of this metabolite right now and metabolites associated to this one. So uh, I'm basically done. And uh, we are really puzzled still by this uh, result where there is a decrease in uh, uh, richness between young and old uh, fish in their microbial uh, composition. So we don't know what's driving this. We don't know whether these are, so that's our outstanding question is that what, what is it, what's, what's driving this, this change, right? The, are these intrinsic microbial dynamics? Is this ecology of microbes in the gut? If you populate, you know, with these communities, a, a tube, would the, those same uh, communities take over basically? Um, or is this something that is driven by the host? Is it the host that it's uh, controlling the diversity uh, maintenance in the young and it's failing to maintain a diverse environment in the old? These are the type of questions that we are trying to ask using different approaches. And so basically to conclude, uh, I showed you that you know, there are changes happening in the gut microbiota composition and possibly function with age. And then by repopulating with young gut microbiota, young uh, uh, middle age uh, killifish, we are able to sustain a richer and uh, beneficial community that's uh, yeah, benefiting the host. And we're very much interested in whether this applies more broadly to other organisms, including mammals. So we have recently started uh, a new cohort, uh, a cohort of mice, and we are doing a similar experiment now in mouse to know whether uh, this, 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 uh, this approach also benefits more broadly mammals. With that, I would like to thank my lab, and in particular, Pat, for the microbiome work together with David and Miriam, and uh, Ray and David for the population genetics part that I showed you, um, all my lab for being an amazing lab, and my collaborators, uh, and the funding. And I would like to thank you again for your attention and I would be happy to take any questions.